I'd like to introduce Sunitra Gupta. She, um, she's a theoretical ep epidemiologist from Oxford University. She spoke at our first symposium back in August last year, uh, which turned out to be the most popular clip on, on our YouTube channel. Um, tens of thousands of people have watched that clip. And, and uh, from there on, Sinetra, um has kept speaking uh, and, and talking about what she sees uh, and keep doing her analysis. Very grateful that she can join us again today. Uh, Sinetra, are you there with us? I am indeed, yes. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you for asking me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, very, I'm very glad uh, we're honored we're very glad to have you back with us uh despite everything that's happened um uh but um we can talk a little bit more about that uh, afterwards um so i'd i'd like to invite you to um, um shoot away with your presentation if you've if you'd like okay to. can i if i can share my screen yes I hope that's um possible um there we go Right, we can see that. We can see that. I can see that, and now I've got to try and find how to. Oops, how to get the slideshow. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay. Right. So, um, you know, I'm going to try and keep this short. Um, I used to have this as my final slide, but now I've started to give talks at with this as my first slide, which is just to say the starting point really for all of us in thinking about how to cope with this situation is that we cannot afford lockdowns. So that's true in many parts of the world and is, I believe is also true in the UK. Lockdowns are a luxury that only the affluent within an affluent country can actually afford as my colleague Martin Kuldorf recently put it, lockdowns are, um, are like protect, are like focus protection for the liberal elite, essentially, and they, they protect those of us who can conduct our business through laptops and Zoom and whatnot, and have houses and gardens that um, allow us to accommodate our children and others we care about. Um, but they are absolutely disastrous at every level for the poor and the young, both in the global north and the global south. And actually, one of the projects I've been um, involved with in initiating since I last spoke is called Collateral Global, where, where we seek to, um, uh, we're trying to develop a global repository for research into the collateral effects of COVID-19 lockdown measures. And when we say effects, we do we are going to actually look at both positive and negative effects. But we do think it's very important to have these in focus before you can develop any kind of rational policy. So also what's happened, although I may have actually shown you this slide in, in August, is that, is that we um, some of us have uh, got together um, uh, and various groups have um, got together to a look at other solutions and the one that um, I've been advocating is um, one of focused protection whereby we shelter the vulnerable specifically which is something that is afforded to us by the nature of COVID-19 in that it is there is a clearly identifiable, identifiable group of people who are vulnerable to severe disease and death um, and in October, um, Jay Bhattacharya will be speaking as well. And Martin Kuldorf and I got together and produced um, something we call the Great Barrington Declaration, which um, has uh, put forward this idea and tried to flesh it out as, as a sort of policy uh, document and um, has attracted uh, attention, both negative and positive since then. So the idea is to take advantage of two things. One, that the um, pathogen acts in such a way as we can identify who is vulnerable and who's likely to die, which is mainly the elderly and the frail, but also those with certain comorbidities. Um, what this allows us to do is to um, protect the rest of the population from the harms of lockdown 
and which also allows immunity to accumulate in the population, what we used to call, and hopefully will continue to call herd immunity, despite it suddenly having become this rather dirty word. So, uh, so this is possible if you shelter the vulnerable and allow the, um, the rest of the population to function. Normally we'd recommended that we invest none, of course, in therapy and vaccination, particularly since vaccination is a, is a means of protecting the vulnerable. And that's indeed what we now have with the array of vaccines at our disposal. And one of the other things um, that I th thought was missing from the debate and continues to be missing from the debate is that we need to think outside national boundaries and consider our responsibilities as international citizens in dealing with this solution. So of course, this is met with a barrage of criticisms. And the first of these is what if there is, which was put forward by people who thought we were somehow um, advocating something that would kill a lot of people. And the first objection was what if there is no naturally acquired immunity to um, this SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And that we know um, is, is simply um, not true. There was no reason for us to think there'd be na no naturally acquired immunity to this virus. It uh, belongs to a family of other coronaviruses for which we have ample um, uh, evidence that there is naturally acquired immunity. And now we know, now that so much time has elapsed, we have been able to do uh, studies which confirm that COVID-19 elicits a long-term immunity. This is not always evident in um, whether people have antibodies in their blood at the time they're sampled, those could disappear, but the immune memory, the ability to fight the virus, um, particularly at the level of um, acquire whether or not you come down with severe disease and die is definitely retained. What that means is that we can um, continue to use this model, which is what is the basis of what most people um, use, uh, whether in a very simple form or a complicated uh, computer simulation form. A fundamental sort of framework known as the SIR framework is what people use to study the dynamics of um, COVID. And in this framework, people go from being susceptible to being infected and then recover, write down a set of equations or a computer simulation, and you get um, an epidemic where the accumulation of people in the recovered class who are immune, at least for the time being, causes the epidemic to turn over and, and um, start to die away. And this is something obviously that's hard uh, to, I mean, it's hard to determine whether the extent to which herd immunity has contributed to um, the, the decline in cases uh, that we see worldwide, are seeing worldwide at the moment. Um, but there are, in because of the um, interventions that we've be also been putting in place, but there are regions where um, it's incontrovertibly been herd immunity that has uh, uh, resulted in the resolution of at least what people would call the first wave of the um, epidemic, such as in Manaus in Brazil, and several papers have been published or um, showing both that the um, shape of the epidemic, the increase in deaths, hospitalizations, and its subsequent resolution um, was accompanied by an increase in the prevalence of antibodies, an indication that uh, a large number of people had been exposed to um, the virus. So this is implies that herd immunity plays an important role in the control of this virus and that we can use it as a tool in trying in keeping the risk of infection low to those who are vulnerable. Since then, um, however, in, in Manaus, we have seen a uh, resurgence of COVID-19 and the people, some of the authors of one of the papers that I just showed have um, within two weeks of publishing the paper came uh, produced a commentary in which they suggested um, a number of reasons for why this might be happening 
And one of these is that immunity against infection might already have begun to wane by December, uh, following the, the, the first wave in, in April. And this is also uh, it aligns with the concern that people have had in our focus protection hypothesis, which it, in which herd immunity plays a role. Um, what if herd immunity doesn't last forever? Or what if it doesn't last forever? Does that mean, as um, some people have suggested, that, um, that, that we can't get to herd immunity? Uh, there's, there are very good reasons to believe that it might not last forever because seasonal coronaviruses, other circulating coronaviruses, um, do not give you lifelong immunity in the way, for example, measles does. The pattern there is that it, these coronaviruses exist at a sort of endemic equilibrium uh, where people keep getting reinfected, but reinfections carry with them very little risk of severe disease and death, which is why we don't normally worry about coronaviruses. So if that's true of this coronavirus, um, how then can we think about herd immunity? Well, the truth is that whether immunity lasts forever or not, does not actually impact upon the buildup of and maintenance of herd immunity. So you could have an SIR model in which people remain immune forever, or you can have what we call an SIRS model, which is probably the better um, metaphor for coronaviruses, and in where people go from being recovered, they lose their immunity and become susceptible again. And in both cases, if you do the um, the mathematics, you'll find that herd immunity is reached at a point where the proportion immune in the population is um, at a particular threshold that's determined by the fundamental transmission characteristics of the virus itself, which is reflected in this quantity R naught. And this is the same, that level, that level at which um, everything settles, what we would call an endemic equilibrium, the level of immunity in the population is the same for both the SI and the SIRS. In other words, the rate of loss of immunity does not influence the establishment or maintenance of herd immunity. Um, in contrast to uh, many statements that were made, and the one that I'm showing you here is from an article in Nature, uh, which entitled The False Promise of Herd Immunity, uh, which suggests that that you never reach herd immunity through natural transmission if there is a rate of loss of immunity. Um, I often use this uh, cistern analogy to explain what's going on here. Within a cistern, the level of water is maintained at a constant, um, it's a constant level maintained, it, um, dis and, and this is independent of the rate at which water flows in and out. So measles would be a system in which water is flowing out um, very slowly, trickling out slowly um, as people die, and then you get new infections, newborns, um, or people born into the population filling up the system. Coronavirus a little different, you get the water flowing out quickly, um, people being reinfected and um, coming in um, to the, sorry, um, but the, the system keeps, uh, maintains the level through a more dynamic loss of water, um, loss of infected, sorry, immune people, reinfections, but importantly, those reinfections do not carry with them a high risk of disease or death, and therefore we still maintain um, the endemic equilibrium we want where the deaths are kept low. The other thing that we um, uh, know now is that previous exposure to other coronaviruses does give you some level of protection against particularly against disease from the new virus. And so in fact, the system, going by the system analogy, we didn't actually start with an empty system with coronavirus. And some work that my group, Jose Lorenzo and Francesco Pinotti have done shows that under those circumstances, you don't really, the level of exposure required in a population to reach endemic equilibrium is much lower. So we mustn't confuse low, observations of low prevalence of antibodies with um, that does not mean that we haven't reached a level where things are being kept in control by herd immunity. 
Furthermore, uh, once you factor in effects of seasonality, you can start to find patterns that correspond entirely to what we've observed in many parts of the world um, in terms of an initial early peak and a seasonal increase at a later point in time. And this is, these are just some simulations showing how the duration of immunity in combination with seasonality can give you those patterns. A paper published in Science uh, a few months ago also um, uh, reveals, that the, that shows the same sort of dynamic occurring. This is from Brian Grenfell's group, again, an SIRS model, but here they make the distinction again between being reinfected and infected for the first time, which allows you to see that you can easily replicate and understand what's going on and where we're headed in terms of a new virus coming in to which there was some immunity um, to a lot of immunity already to disease, some immunity to infection, and how obviously that would cause an initial large peak, but then settle into this pattern whereby you get um, the, the infection levels sort of oscillate around an equilibrium uh, due to seasonality and other considerations. So that could certainly be what underlies this uh, in recent increase in Manaus. But other explanations that the, the authors offered, which um, are pertinent to, to the current sort of discussion around uh, what's happening with SARS-CoV-2, is that uh, um, there are new lineages emerging and these may have properties that allow them to cause a second epidemic. For example, um, there may have been a new lineage that occurred and we know there are new lineages emerging in um, Manaus and in, in Brazil, which um, have a higher inherent transmissibility than pre-existing lineages. So this P1 lineage is one of the variants of concern that's emerged in Brazil that people are worried about now. Um, the real question is, are, oh, and there are several others, but you know, that's why we've, the UK has closed its borders, uh, obliging people to stay in quarantine, and apparently you can go to prison now for 10 years for lying about having gone to Portugal en route. Um, and these are all predicated on this idea that some of these new variants that are arising are more transmissible. Are they? Well, in order to understand this, we have to, again, we can employ the SIR framework, but this time we have to think about variation in, in the possible um, strains and variants of, of the virus. And the simple answer is that, um, indeed, it may well be that some of these variants are more transmissible, but the truth is that within a system where you have a lot of immunity shared amongst the variants, as you will have, because we know there's strong cross responses, not just amongst variants of coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also amongst within the whole coronavirus family. What you tend to get under these circumstances is competitive exclusion. So the strain with a higher R0 wins. And then what that means is that even with a marginal increase in transmissibility, that could see a new variant sweep through. But that does not really have much of a material effect or difference in um, how we deal with the virus. In other words, the surge in the virus cannot be ascribed to a new variant, or it's very improbable that the reason why we're seeing surges is because the new variants are more transmissible. On the contrary, what's much more likely is the new variants are slightly more transmissible um, and because they're in a very competitive environment due to all the herd immunity that's built up, and because some of these mitigation methods, lockdowns, also make the scramble for, intensify the scramble for susceptible individuals, because of these circumstances, we are favouring variants that have only a marginal um, uh, advantage in terms of transmissibility. The other big question is, are these variants more virulent? And the truth is that we don't know, but it's unlikely so far, the data don't seem to say so, despite these scary headlines. And generally within these systems, what you have is a sort of trade-off between virulence and transmission. So pathogens tend to evolve, but not always towards lower virulence because that 
optimize, m maximizes their transmissibility. But generally, what we'd expect are small var variations in virulence and transmissibility, and one strain will probably emerge as the victor. But it's very, it's improbable, it's not impossible, but it is much more probable that these strains will not be materially so different that we'd have to alter our policies. In any case, the focus protection strategy kind of circumvents all these uh, uncertainties by putting forward a proposal which allows us to protect people and save them from severe disease or give them um, protection from severe disease and death, even if there were to be such uh, unusual, unlikely changes in the pathogen. Um, the other final uh, option that was considered by um, Esther Sabino and her colleagues is that which we're all thinking about is will these lineages are these new lineages able to evade immunity generated in response to previous infection? Is this an immune escape? Now that is worrying, of course, because at the moment uh, what we have, the best way of delivering focus protection is through vaccines. And so th this is a question that we uh, that needs to be answered and people are answering, trying to answer it. And it's clear and not surprising at all that some of these mutations, because they do happen to be in the very targets of immunity that actually um, are important for the virus to gain entry into cells, that some of these um, mutations are stopping or preventing the neutralization of the virus. But there are a wealth of other targets on the virus um, on the surface uh, of the spike protein and certainly natural infection gives you a whole array of other responses. So it's unlikely to alter protection, at least against severe disease and death. It may all compromise uh, protection against infection, but it's not likely to alter protection against severe disease and death. So now we are back to this solution. We can refine it. We now have a good means uh, of a very reliable way of sheltering the vulnerable by using all these vaccines that have been developed um, so quickly, so remarkably well, because these vaccines, one thing we know we can be sure of is no matter how much mutation there is and whatever else happens, that they're very likely to protect, continue to protect against severe disease and death. And that's what we want. We have no idea even without mutation, how well they work against infection. And so it's not a good, um, it's not sensible to think of these vaccines as giving us herd immunity against transmission uh, in the way that measles vaccines can do. So I think we're going to have to rely on naturally acquired herd immunity in combination with vaccine um, induced protection um, focus protection of the, of the vulnerables in order to provide a global solution to the problem. And once again, in doing that, we need to, instead of closing borders, try and think outside national boundaries. In the end, I hope we will achieve a solution, which another slide I tend to show, um, which combines our considerations of not just an understanding the logos, if you like, of this pathogen, how it um, the, the science, as people like to call it, of how it spreads and how immunity accumulates and how to make vaccines, but also to integrate into that what we do as human beings, considerations of pathos, in other words, socioeconomic um, environment, um, considerations, as well as ethos. How do we want to live our lives? Thank you very much. Thanks, Sinatra. Um, so you've got some time for some questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably just I'm going to pick up on on the last point you made, and it was the one that right at the start, and it is the one that you mentioned uh, in the first uh, presentation, and that's about the national boundaries, um, because it was something that has wasn't being touched on at the time, and and really still hasn't. That that such an one of the effects of COVID-19 and government responses has been nationalization, um, uh, with the latest of which we've seen is in the, the fight over vaccines. Um, how might things have been different um, 
one of the, one of the things that struck us has been uh, every country seems to talk about its own battle uh, with COVID uh, and and focus on their own responses and whether or not they've been successful. Um, it doesn't it doesn't appear as if we are learning well enough from each other. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's astonishing. I mean, I've been astonished right from the start at the lack of um, international perspective here and a dereliction, as I feel, of our duties as international citizens, which I believe we have, uh, you know, we signed up to all of this partly, you know, some of us due to our principles, some of us because we thought it was how um, uh, the, the global market appealed to um, them, I should say. Um, and so there, there were all these sort of, you know, there are various, from various perspectives, the idea that we were a global economy and, you know, all sorts of issues of internationalism, um, I thought had moved to a very advanced stage where we couldn't just go back to this sort of tribal kind of sit, uh, situation where we were only going to look after our national interests and gloat over, you know, having achieved something when it's clearly at the expense of, of, of other countries who simply can't afford it and are damaged by the policies that we're adopting to protect um, our own citizens. So even if it is seen as the only way forward, I don't think it should be something um, you should be proud of. You should be apologetic about having to protect your own citizens at the expense of the, the well-being of uh, global citizens. Is that something that your collateral global uh, effort is is counting the effects on, uh, say, poorer nations of withdrawal? Absolutely. Out, out, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a, the big focus of, of that project. Um, I'm going to ask just a couple of questions about trying to understand what what I think you've been taking us through. Um, it appears that what you're saying, what, what you've summarized is this endemic equi equilibrium that SARS-CoV-2 is nothing out of the ordinary, that, that, that all of um, uh, what we know is herd immunity um, and the fluctuations of the virus and the new strains, all of that is what we would expect to see under any coronavirus. And, and none, none of these new developments, if we call it that, are, are in themselves um, unusual or scary. Yes, I mean, I think it, it is a new phenomenon in that it has entered a population that has not, um, you know, it's, it's it, what we've experienced is its epidemic phase. And so one of the problems that I've encountered or people seem to, one of the confusions, major sources of confusion is when people say, well, it, it's not like flu. Flu only kills, you know, um, 650,000 people a year. And that's flu in its endemic state. And COVID, of course, has gone through an epidemic phase in which it is likely to have a much higher death toll. Flu in an epidemic phase um, would kill very many more people. But what we can expect COVID to do is settle to an endemic state. And what the Focus Protection Plan offers is a way of getting to that endemic state um, without sacrificing or, or, or sacrificing isn't even the right word. We, and in that, we want to reach that state without allowing people to die. Mm. So if possible. And so what it does is offers a, a, a way of doing that. So you protect the vulnerable, you shield them over that particular epidemic period. And then when that epidemic period is over, they are no more um, vulnerable to corona, this particular virus than they are to other coronaviruses. So that's the idea, mm -hmm. is we take the risk, pull this risk back right down to the sorts of risks we um, endure, that we, we are happy to accept as a society. So that's, that, that's where we should be. Well, it's inevitable that we will head there. Mm. Um, but it's a question of how do we get there? And the vaccine, of course, gives us a very useful route for approaching that. But what the vaccine won't do, I don't think, it doesn't seem to have the um, ability to do, particularly if there is, um, in the face of a mutating virus population, is it's not going to give you protection against infection, which would allow us, like measles, to get to a state where 
uh, of endemic equilibrium um, without um, uh, where people were infect, uh, protected against infection through vaccination. But that's not going to happen. All we can do with this vaccine at the moment is protect those who are vulnerable. Ah, okay. Hey, so you you mentioned uh, herd immunity that it was that's become a, a dirty word or dirty phrase. How did something that was seemed such a simple part of epidemiology um, become demonised? How how and why do you think? Well, how I think is through confusion. So I think. Um, People assumed that herd immunity, well, they, it became a sort of uh, a stand-in for a policy whereby um, you would allow the virus to just do its thing, let it rip, as it were. So it became um, interchangeable with that concept, which, which it isn't, because after all, I mean, herd immunity is just a phenomenon, whereas a let it rip strategy is, is a decision on part of a, a government or a country or an individual. So that, that's how it came to um, present to a certain group of people a, a policy that, that was unacceptable to them and uh, carried connotations of uh, not having any interest in the well-being of the elderly and the frail, which is rather unfortunate. Um, and generally speaking, I think the concept of herd immunity is, is, is um, is misunderstood and that people assume that once you reach herd immunity, the disease goes away. And that's not true. What, what herd immunity, uh, herd immunity as such simply refers to the protection that you gain from other people in your community being immune. And thresholds of herd immunity are uh, ones which when crossed um, uh, make the infection decline. But generally speaking, where we end up is at that threshold which is an equilibrium state where infections neither grow nor decline, except in some sort of seasonal way, which is um, just a sort of bobbing up and down around an equilibrium. So these concepts, which are not terribly difficult to take on board, but, but also very easy to misunderstand, particularly if you have a desire, some sort of political desire to um, misunderstand them, um, is what's led to this. And that's what you're really asking is why and the why is a complex book. Um, I've just been reading a very a manuscript of a, a proofs of a very good book by Toby Green, which will be coming out, I think, in April. And one of the things he says is that there were people who were rightfully so keen to get rid of characters like Trump and Bolsonaro that they just decided to, to politicize this whole thing in a way that's been incredibly unhelpful and damaging to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's at least, I mean, the, the polar, basically the politicization of this um, scientific dialogue has been to the detriment. And when I say detriment, we're talking a serious detriment to um, many ordinary people. What um, sort of data has been provided by countries uh, where they've experienced variants that, that people are asserting are more virulent or transmissible? Um, it, it, have we, because I think what I saw in your slides was that it's not really there, that, that, that this doesn't exist. Um, but we're seeing headlines that claim it is, and South Africa claiming that, you know, that it's one is, and that the vaccine doesn't, doesn't handle it. But is the data there? Have you seen it? So, so the first of all, the, the data that have been misinterpreted and rather strangely by people who should be and are experts in the field is that some of the variants, one of the, the one in Britain, for example, seems to be taking over from what was there before. But as I explained, so for something to take over, it doesn't have to have hugely higher transmissibility. It's just, you know, there are, it's a tug of war and, you know, you can attach a mouse to one end of a the tug of war and, and pull the whole thing across to, to one side. And that is more likely to be what happened than a large elephant having been attached to the other side. So there is no indicate just because something is growing and taking over um, does not mean that it is hugely more transmissible. And it's, it's sort of, it's the inverse. So because cases are rising, cases rose because of seasonality without any doubt. 
Um, so that right, and, and within that rise in cases, so there's sudden expansion, the, the strain that was slightly more transmissible is very likely to, to expand more and take over very quickly. Um, it doesn't, uh, it does not merit, or um, it, it, what it doesn't justify at all is the panic and the closure of borders um, surrounding that narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think that narrative is flawed and the worry, it doesn't matter, anyone can come up with narratives and narratives, they are all somewhat flawed, but when a flawed narrative is used or an improbable narrative is used to um, inflict these sorts of conditions, then one has to really think about how it needs to be questioned. So um, uh, just trying to understand um, your, your presentation to me seems to be saying that the last year has been um, the, this, this rise of a pandemic, but these, if it hasn't yet, the settling back to some sort of endemic equilibrium. Um, that all of that was going to happen one way or another. Uh, and so, and everything we've seen has been heading towards that. And, you, and you're saying that the best thing to have done uh, was uh, remove the most vulnerable and while the rest of us kind of, um, for want of a better term, endure or be part of uh, that re the settling down to the equilibrium? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think I think that would because I mean the main reason for that is the huge collateral damage that any other. I mean, so what can the, you can either suppress the infection or let it run its course. Um, and suppressing the infection is problematic for two reasons. One is that it's a temporary measure, mm. um, and secondly, because it has such a huge cost. Mm. So one option, of course, that one could consider is we suppress the infection until we have a vaccine, even if that vaccine only protects the vulnerable population. So that that that's a you know a possible strategy. But um, in order to figure out whether that strategy is a, is a viable one, you need to think about two things. One is how likely is that to be a vaccine, which has always been you know a big question mark. Fortunately now no longer a question mark. And the second question is, can we afford to stay in lockdown until that period, until that event? And for most areas, most parts of this, the world, the answer is no. And um, yet it happened. Did we suppress the virus at all, though, in, in any, of the, any of these attempts? Um, did the, and if, if we did, did that just change behavior of the virus? Um, it's it's very hard to say um, whether we were able to suppress the virus. I think it's a question of, um, you know, how much lockdown is necessary. I mean, what's the relationship between if, if there's a scale of mitigation, severity of mitigation and success in suppressing the virus? I think that relationship is very nonlinear. Mm. So, uh, it, but it's very hard to say. In other words, what I'm saying is, if you look at the trajectories in somewhere like Sweden or in the UK, the extent to, you can have two extremes uh, uh, in terms of explanations. You could say in one extreme, everything was just simply down to um, mandated or non-mandated um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. In the other extreme, you, could, you can easily set up a model such as some of the ones I showed you where it's all down to herd immunity and seasonality. Now, the truth is going to be somewhere in between there. And what I think, I don't think we have the, um, we're slowly starting to uh, get the data that allows us to say where it actually lies. But what we need to do at the, what the beauty of focus protection is that it says, it gives you a means of moving forwards, even with that uncertainty of which, actually happened. So rather than engaging in some kind of academic battle or quibble over what worked and what didn't work, um, I think what we need to do is keep very much, keep in focus the costs of all of this and uh, globally as global citizens and come up with ideas such as focus protection, which now we can deliver through vaccination um, and um, 
you know, prevent ourselves from entering a situation. The head of the army in Britain wrote today saying this form of nationalism is going to create major instability. And he's worried that this could lead to, you know, a, a major war or a set of um, wars, uh, because that's what nationalism leads to after all. So, and deprivation and national nationalism, well, we know what, what happened a hundred years ago in the face of that in Germany. So we have to be very careful and we are what, seeing all sorts of rules and laws being brought in and, and, uh, and, uh, and a huge disregard for the suffering that's being caused to, to children and to the poor. So I think that we really need to move, move forwards with those things, ideas in mind and not ascribe them as people are doing now to the virus itself, but take responsibility for those, um, for, for the acts, what, what we, the mitigation, the acts of mitigation having caused these harms. Mm. Um, yes, it's something that certainly troubles me is that the, the approach over the past year has been the nationalism of it, but um, a lot of the, um, the way it's been conducted has been very unsettling and changing of, of the, the global environment, the global um, uh, geopolitical situation. But um, we will be covering that with some of our other speakers. I've got um, a, a big question to ask of you, and, I, uh, and that's about the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, something that uh, I, was very, I was very proud to see you do. Uh, it, was a very, it was a brave thing. Can you describe, uh, though, um, uh, what it felt like afterwards? <laughs> after, did, did you attract the attention you expected? Uh, uh, did it do the job you wanted it to do? Well, I mean, too, and um, it attracted more attention than we expected, perhaps. I mean, there was, it's um, certainly become part of the vocabulary of many of these <laughs> debates. So, so there, um, it certainly, and it, it gave people the license mm. to express themselves, which, I mean, this has been a very sad part of all of this, is, is finding people, finding that a lot of people are really afraid to speak out. Mm. And this, this is really unfortunate. Um, so it has given a platform to some people um, who wouldn't otherwise be able to speak out. So, so that those are all good things. Um, but of course, it's been vilified and, and misrepresented. And um, at the moment, there's, there's, you know, it's been weeks of relentless kind of um, ad hominem abuse that many of us have been suffering as a result of it. So uh, now, of course, I feel that I feel there was no choice but to, to do this. And it was good because it arose independently. There's a bunch of people independently coming together to say this. So it wasn't a group of people who um, know each other and review each other's papers and um, uh, all sort of saying, hey, let's let's do this. Um, it really was, it's, it's quite um, life affirming to see a bunch of people around the world who didn't even know of each other's existence coming together out of their convictions to, to put something together. And, and have other people sign up to it. So it's it's certainly altered my life, but um, overall I'd say in positive ways. Um, but it's also, but hopefully, but it hasn't really, I mean, it, it didn't, I mean, none of the governments really listened to it, um, not in the UK, even though um, some people think that the UK delayed putting in harsher measures because of it which is uh, unfortunately not the case but um, so it's not really had the effect the desired effect on policy but it has certainly had an effect on um, public opinion I think and, and given people the space to think about all of this I hope in a more nuanced way mm. yes so taking the uh, the focus protection format and the, it's the way the vaccines can fit in 
Um, do you think uh, that the perspective of yourself and ourselves uh, and the Great Barrington, that, that that can have an influence, that there, we can uh, change the way that we, we settle back into an, an endemic equilibrium? Well, we were hoping very much um, uh, that once these vaccines, had, now that they're, they're there, that, you know, I didn't, I started to talk about the objections to the Great Barrington Declaration in terms of yes. sort of um, biological facts, like is there herd immunity at all? But a, a very big kind of um, uh, objection was that you know, how can you actually deliver focus protection, which is a you know very valid point. That's exactly what we wanted. We wanted a debate around that. There wasn't a debate. It was more of a, an outright rejection. Um, you know, people laughing in our faces, which seemed very odd because many of the ways that you would deliver focus protection were exactly what we do in lockdown anyway. It's just restricted to a group of people rather than the whole um, uh, population. So, um, but we thought, we were hoping that the vaccine would give us a sort of, you know, meeting point where mm -hmm focus protection could be delivered through the vaccine and that would be the end of that and those who said well we're of the opinion that we should stay locked down until such a point arrives you, i mean I'm, we're, I'm very happy to say yeah maybe you're right i don't mind what i really want now is for the children here to go back to school and for the damage that's already been done um to people's lives to be limited we're in a to go into more mode of damage limitation now is all the best we can hope for. Uh, so one other question, if I may, um, and that's, that's about vaccines again. Um, so do, does does mass vaccination, is that is that necessary? Is that going to be um, uh, the, the sticking point? Um, do you think it matters? I, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a problem. Yes, I agree, because I, I think the way to use vaccines is to deliver focus protection. Mm. And I don't think we should be vaccinating everybody. I don't think, I think we should rely on a combination of focus protection through vaccination and naturally acquired immunity to provide an absolutely solid, in, impenetrable wall um, against this virus. I, I also think that, you know, in a few years' time, it may not even be that, you know, people will build up the immunity they need um, that will see them through. Mm. Some some people, you know, like people with comorbidities who aren't succumbing to other coronaviruses are obviously not doing so because they've already been exposed to those coronaviruses at a time when they weren't vulnerable. So, you know, the need for a vaccine will diminish with time, I think, but at the moment it's a most wonderful tool that we have um, to enact uh, focus protection, but we will... I think we'll always need, as we do with influenza at the moment, um, you know, having herd immunity. If we did not have herd immunity in place for influenza, we would be in really serious trouble. And I think it's very important that we allow that to occur. We should be grateful that we can allow herd immunity to accumulate um, without suffering losses of life, especially in the young, um, by protecting the elderly and the frail and the vulnerable for, other, for those with comorbidities using a vaccine and uh, and through other means as well. I mean, not maybe vaccination won't be um, the best, won't be something that all vulnerable people can um, can have. So, so you know, we, we need to keep in place this idea that we must protect the vulnerable through vaccination and other means and bring the risks of infection down through herd immunity. And I think that's the only way forwards. Thank you, Sinatra. Um, I really appreciate you joining us um, uh, on a Friday evening um, and, and giving us your time again. Um, My I hope, pleasure. Hopefully I'm speaking for everyone. For the rest of the symposium. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody for listening in on that. We'll take a, a break for, for five minutes and, and next up with David Katz. Um, uh, what I had wanted to say to Sinatra there was that how um, proud I think we all are of her and her efforts and um, the uh, her continuing on after a loss of the, uh, after she took the brunt of a lot of 
um, uh, aggression um, because of the position she was taking, which, as you would have seen, is totally science-based and totally reasonable. Um, and that, that's what makes these remarkable times. Next up is David Katz. Um, we'll just take a break for a few minutes. Don't uh, go too far away from your screen. We'll start in five minutes time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 